Chisels are great for so many things, especially because you can use them for rough or fine work. And so there's just a ton of ways to use them. And one of the most versatile tools in the shop. But I think there's a tendency when people are watching these instructional videos that they don't understand what is really important when setting up or using your chisel and what's just like something you want to get good at over time. So let me take you through some tips and tricks for the average woodworker, somebody who might be new or intermediate in their journey, and tell you what some basic strategies that can help you get really good results. Let's come on into the bench and let's talk about different types of chisels. Today we're gonna to talk mostly about bench chisels, far and away the most popular chisels by quite a bit. They typically have a beveled side that allows you to get into corners, come in different variations like these skew chisels. These Japanese chisels are kind of, these are some old chisels I got at a flea market, but. They're, they're more of a mortising chisel because they have those flat 90 degree sides, allows you to really hog out material better. And then I have some like real specialty chisels like these uh, 16th inch wide ones that carvers use. So let's talk about what really matters. I have a great video uh, comparing the Stanley 750s and the Narex Richter chisels on my channel. I'll link that up here in your top right hand corner. When it comes to chisels, there's very few things that matter like sharpness. Sharpness is paramount for two things. One. <laughs> gives you good results. There is no denying that. Two, a dull chisel is unsafe. A dull chisel is harder to push or hit. It tends to slip or come out more. So it, a dull chisel is unsafe, so you wanna make sure you're sharp. And here's a test I do every time before I start using my chisels. And I don't mean like every time I pick up my chisel. I mean like every day that I'm gonna be using my chisel. I take a piece of paper and I take the chisel and it cuts, but see how that kind of rips a little bit? Let's find one that rips a little worse than that. Here's another one. That one's doing okay. Come on, baby, one of you guys. Oh, there we go, this one's ripping a little bit. It's cutting through the piece of paper, but not well. And let me show you what well means. Now, this does not mean that you need to resharpen your chisels. I can't stress that enough. I don't sharpen that often, I really don't, because I have a couple tricks that I use. The first one is a strop. Now, when you do the paper test, and doing the paper test regularly, why that's so great is it lets you fix this before you have to completely resharpen. You know, I probably resharpen every couple of months, but I strop every time, or I use my buffer every time. And let me show you how well this works here, is you just take your stropping compound, you just put a little bit on there, especially if it's built up like you see mine has, uh, and then you're gonna wanna lock down your strop. And you just take your chisel and you wanna put firm pressure, you lock your wrists and do this 20 to 30 times. Then once you've done the top, you just take it and drag it backwards another 10, 15 times just like that. And then watch this, watch how well my paper cuts now. And keep in mind that was all of 15 seconds of work. Look at that, just slices right through. And it's not as sharp as it could be, but here's my other little cheater trick that I use all the time. So check it out, this is a slow speed, a cheap slow speed grinder I got on Amazon a few years ago for just a couple bucks. And I've got a buffing wheel on it, I've got some number six high gloss polishing compound. You just put a little bit on there, just like the strop, you don't wanna overload it. And then this takes all of four seconds, I go three times. One, two, three, and then holding on to it because you don't want it to get sucked in there, you can just do the back real quick. And I haven't even cleaned it off yet. Here's our piece of paper now, look at that. Just simple, make shavings. Just like that. So this is my little cheater trick that I use all the time. One last note about stropping before we move on to sharpening systems is you can round over that primary bevel. Uh, one, if you're pressing way, way too hard, and two, if you're not locking your wrists in and you're stropping like this, you're gonna round over that bevel, and that's when it's time to redo your sharpening on a stone or sandpaper, whatever you do. But I never redo the 25 degree bevel, my primary bevel, I always just redo the secondary bevel. I don't think I've ever really gone full tilt on these on the primary bevel, because I just don't think it's necessary. The other thing I didn't realize wasn't necessary is flattening the whole back. You certainly don't need to flatten the whole back because how often are you gonna be giving it more than half an inch deep, right? And <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. And so, like, what's the point of flattening all the way back up here? How often are you gonna need a perfectly flat reference edge three inches down? And even if you're flat on a surface and you're using it, I, I can't ever see needing more than an inch of reference area to a point that matters. Maybe if you were 
you know, milling aluminum on a Bridgeport milling machine, that kind of accuracy matters. But for chisels, having a half inch to an inch of flatness is plenty. You don't need any more than that. So let's talk about sharpening systems. Here I have three systems. I've got the Scary Sharp system, which is lapping film, AKA really high grit sandpaper on something that is flat. Here I have float glass, you can use MDF. I have a phenomenal video on this that will be linked in the pinned comment and description as well as here in the upper right hand corner. Then you have water stones, water stones, these are kind of in order of price. Scary Sharp system, water stones, and then diamond stones. And some water stones are gonna be really expensive, some are gonna be cheap. You gotta continually flatten them, soak them in water, they are messy, but they're gonna give you the best results in my opinion. They're great, but they are certainly not the cheapest. Scary Sharp is by far the cheapest and it is a great system. I love this system. This is what I usually reach for. Water stones I think are the fastest at cutting. There might be some debate in the comments on that. And then there's diamond stones. Diamond stones are great. They stay flat. They're easy to clean and you just spray some Windex on there, do your sharpening and they're good to go. I also use my coarse stone which is this one for flattening my water stones. And it works great. You can buy a flattening stone for it. I, I don't really need it. Again, that's one of those things that people convince you you need a bunch of gizmos and whatchamacallits. But really, you know, these are designed to be flat. Gets it flat, good to go. And then there's sharpening jigs. I am a good sharpener. I get things very, very sharp and I still use a sharpening jig. Here's a couple of them. This is a very expensive one, the Veritas Mark II. I have never been a fan of this one. I find this back roller here, it has all these different angle adjustments. I find it is really tough for me to keep my bevel square. And that's fine. It doesn't need to be 100% square. That's another one that people really freak out about is how square this front needs to be. But in reality, it just needs to be pretty close. I mean, you're always gonna be using a chisel that is smaller than the opening you are trying to chisel. And so if this is off by a degree or two, that's fine, because the chisel is gonna correct itself when you hit the bottom of whatever it is you're trying to chisel. So that's another one. Yeah, it's great to be square, and you will learn that over time, but don't beat yourself up about it. If you're sharpening and it cuts paper, that's all that matters. After that, it's just small details that are gonna make like 1% difference. This is a jig that we have on our website we just released. It's super cool because it's inexpensive, but has this really fat roller, very similar to the Mark II, which is great because it keeps you from tipping. Those really cheap ones are really tough because they tip. This one's also really cool because it can accept a skew chisel really easily and still keep that 90 degree, which I've never had one that can do that before. It's got these square lines, which makes it really easy. And it comes with a free PDF for a jig for setting the distance. Then what else is really cool about it is you can take the roller off and use this hook over on your bench grinder. Let me actually show you some tricks for regrinding a bevel quickly on a bench grinder. So when you're regrinding a bevel on a bench grinder, there's a couple things you need to do. One is you need your wheel to be square to your table here. And you get one of these wheel dressers. Okay, I'm gonna take my chisel, make sure it's square to the jig, which it is. These lines make it really easy. I'm gonna lock it down here. And then I'm simply going to see there's this hook right here that helps you on the bench grinder. And then I'm simply going to adjust the chisel until you get to that like 25 degree range right there. And now here's the important part is a bucket of water. I'm telling you, you put that on there for more than three seconds, you're gonna ruin the temper. So this is a risky thing if you're not used to this. So go slow and start with a chisel you don't care about. So it's really just like quick touches. And then you dip it in your water. And a little trick that I learned from William Ng, so you can see we're about to go over the top right here, is you'll start to see sparks come over the top when you reach your, like I don't know if you can see them coming off top, it's really tough to see. But you can see we're getting the, the bevel perfectly back right there. I'm not gonna go too far on this, but it's a really easy way to quickly get a primary bevel back and then you can go to your stones and just do your secondary bevel and get a nice clean edge right there at the very, very tip. And the last thing I'll say about sharpening jigs is if you do get the Veritas to their credit, they do have this really cool angle setting jig that helps you create this. Otherwise, you need to create a block. Like I said, we have a free PDF that comes with this one, or I'll link a really good video from Matt Esley that shows you how to do that. And then that's just ready to go like that, which is cool. But again, like I said, I've always had problems with this roller. So let's talk about how to use a chisel. So we can't talk about chisel use without talking about safety. Now for safety, 
There's a couple things that are important. I think every woodworker I know has a scar in their non-dominant hand because they braced a piece of wood and tried to dig into it with their chisel and they stuck the chisel in their hand. I've had stitches from it. I know everyone I know has also had stitches. It's also important that you have good work holding like this mox and vice. We just released a blog on that. I'll link that down below. If you don't want to build a mox and vice, my friend Jay Bates has a really cool video. I'll link where he uses pipe clamps to make a very cheap alternative, but it's important that you never put the soft squishy bits in front of the cutting edge. So when you're using your chisel, you're going to use your hand as a brake. So you don't want to hold up here on the handle and try and hammer. You have a lot less control of that, unless you were chopping out like a ton of waste at a time or, you know, mortise chisel would be different, but you're gonna use your hand as a brake and go like that. And the brake is because you would have cleared out this area and you're just taking the last little bit. And so that keeps you from, you know, when you're hitting, it tends to slip out. Or if you're going all the way through, it keeps it from blowing out the other side. You always want to work towards the middle and never try and cut all the way through from one side. So let's talk about other examples of how I hold it. And we'll talk about some ways that a chisel is used. And then we'll get into some other tips and tricks. Okay, now, first of all, when you're using a chisel, you always want to use a marking knife. You made this in marker so you can see it. But a marking knife line is paramount for a couple of reasons. One, it gives you an exact location to end up at, but two, it also gives you a reference for your chisel. Now you can actually like feel it click in. Now the reason you don't go directly into your line is you see this angle, that's a little exaggerated version of your primary bevel. And if you just try and pound this into the wood like this, it's gonna wanna move backwards. So you always wanna take half your waist, half your waist, half your waist until you get so close to the, your, your marking knife line that you can no longer do half and you drop right in there. You wanna be taking away, your last chop with a chisel is like, you're just creating a shaving essentially. And that's gonna give you a lot of accurate results. And it's gonna keep your chisel from getting dull. Pounding on your chisel into a lot of material is gonna make your chisel dull very quickly. So one of the techniques that I'll use is I'll use what I call beater chisels. You know, some older chisels that I don't really care about. I'll use those to crush out a bunch of material. And then I'll use my, you know, really nice, really sharp chisels when I get down to the line. It's a great way to make your chisels last a little longer. So I'm gonna mark out a mortise here and show you how I do that. Okay, so I purposely left a lot here and we'll pretend that I purposely went over my line because I was looking at this chisel mark. So I just redrew my line here. So pretend this is the one I originally drew. So you can see this is a lot of material. You don't want to take that in one go with a chisel. So you want to take half. Now here's a great little way, instead of like trying to place your chisel down, put it in the wood and then walk it in just like that. So you can put it just kind of close, rest on the wood, put your first corner where you want it and then put your second. So you can see I'm going to take about half of my waist. And again, we're just going to walk it around till we get where we want. Now watch when I first hit it, this chisel is actually going to move backwards a little bit. See that? Moved right into my line and that's what we're trying to avoid. So that's why we take half. So I'm going to hit it and you can feel it bottom out. You'll hear the sound change just like that. We can use the line over here on the side to find it again. And then same thing, you're just going to hit it with a chisel. You can use your hand as the brake, just like that, and you'll feel it bottom out. And then we're going to keep working down our line here to either side, but you don't want to get right into the corner. And the reason is because this has a little bit of a ledge to it. It's going to bruise your corner is what it's called. So we get really close. We don't do that till the very, very end. There we go. And when you're hammering, this is a really cool custom hammer. We're gonna try coming out with something like this, but you want like kind of a small chisel hammer. Here's one Narex makes. I'll link with the Narex chisels that I use. And you don't wanna like use your whole hand to hammer. Something like this is great, but it's gonna be way too big for control. You wanna think about control. So you wanna hold right up near the head and you just tap. And then using your fingers as brakes, you're gonna get perfectly right down to your line. You're gonna get almost to your corner here. And the great thing about mortises is because the only thing that's ever gonna be seen is this very, very, very top part, potentially, and probably a mortise like this, you probably wouldn't see any of it, but it allows you to be a little bit careless with your chiseling below that line. So if you're really careful and you get straight in there, then once you start going down, you can actually undercut it, which is gonna help you fit your tenon a little bit. No harm in that, especially for us average Joes. It just makes life a little bit easier if we know that that's not less than 90, because if it's less than 90, you're, 
once you get glue in there, your tenon's going to bottom out there at the end. Now, what about if you're not good at getting at 90? What's some tricks for that? Well, this is a guide block. So what we're going to do is we're going to take down our waist, down to our line. This chisel's so sharp that I don't even need a hammer. That's the beauty of using sharp chisels. We're going to keep getting closer and closer. And again, we've still left that corner. Just like that, we've gotten really close. Now we have a guide block, but you're like, well, how do I get it 90? Well, that's the beauty of the marking knife line. You lock it into your marking knife line, so you know you're 90 to the wood, and then you just bring it up until it sits completely flush against there. You can take your thumb, brace it against the wood, and there we go. We just got a perfect 90 mortise using guide block. Same thing works for 45s if you're trying to do a 45. Now watch, this is how I do corners. So I brace it against my thumb and I get the flat part of my wall, my mortise wall, and I just barely get that top corner. And then when I rotate in, see how far away it is from the corner so I didn't risk bruising at all. I, my whole goal here is just to get the tip accurate and I do that from both sides, just like that. And then look how crisp and clean that corner is. And that's all you need to do, guys. It's, there's no rocket science to this, and this is what I was talking about. If your chisel's not square at the end here, that's okay, because when you get to the bottom, your chisel's just going to skew a little bit to bottom out that line, and it's going to do it on its own. You don't even have to worry about it. So when you're sharpening, don't beat yourself up. We've gone through into a mortise. Let's talk about some cross grain examples. Okay, so now I purposely cut this really far away from my line to show you a couple things. Now, if you had a rabbiting plane or a router plane, this might be a good opportunity to use it, but only right at the very end when you get really close to your line because a plane is only gonna take off a shaving at a time, whereas with a chisel, you can take off a lot. Now, something to remember is when you're going with the grain, it's gonna wanna split the way the grain goes. So if your grain is very straight, there's very low risk of you like splitting past your line, but that's part of the reason you do a line in the first place. And then you also want to make sure you got the brakes on when you're going with the grain. So here I'm going to stick way away from my line. I got my brakes on my hand here. One hit is going to take this all the way down here. Look at that. You see how that split off that much just with one hit. So you need to be really careful when you're hammering and you always want to do the long grain portion before you do your end grain. Cause when you go down here, that's going to be end grain. So the cool thing about going with long grain, it is, it is really easy, so it takes very little hammer pressure. And this might be a time where you would, I'm gonna turn this board over so you can see how I would do it. This would be a time that you could use your chisel upside down or bevel up uh, like a hand plane because you can control, you can use your hand as the brake. So if it starts to go too low, you can tip your chisel up and that would look like this. And then it's going too low. I can see I've almost got down to my line, so I'm just gonna tip it up here and bust that out. Now, if this were a half lap, you would have something right here, so you couldn't go from the outside to do that, so you would go across the grain. Now, this is where your brakes become even more important. I wouldn't even use a hammer for this because you're gonna to wanna to stop about midway through your board because if you go out the other side, you're gonna get tear out. So that looks like this. You've got wood coming up like this, and you can see this is, again, the beauty of a really sharp chisel. And I'm gonna stop right there in the middle and turn my board around and come from the outside. So that way I'm always meeting in the middle, I'm keeping my handbrake on, and I'm staying above my line. There we go, I went right in my line there, so I know I'm down to depth, but I wanna be careful. Now this is why the back is flat here, is you can reference it, so you stay above your line. You never wanna get in your line until you're almost there, and we haven't even done our edge here. So if I was doing this, which would be one of those times, I'd probably grab my beater chisel and try and get some of this waste down. But you can see how much harder it is to chop that, so. Okay, so now we've gotten real close to our line there. I'm just gonna click it in. You, this would be a great time to grab your block and look at how it just goes right up against there. Hold it with your thumb and go straight down. Now the great part about when you get straight down like that is I now have an, a side I know is 90 degrees. So I can put it against there, hold it with my finger and I know that's 90 and I kind of come into my chisel sort of skewed like that, which one helps with kind of a nice shearing cut, but also helps me keep that 90 degrees there. Now I have a perfect 90 degree shoulder. And then when you get this close, 
what you want to do is take a square and you can locate your high spots there. You can see there's like a big hump here. I bet if I was looking through the camera, I could see my marking knife line there. So we'd go ahead and take that down. So this would be a, another place that your 90 degree chisel block could come in handy, but you have to be a lot more careful here because you're not going through end grain. It's going to go a lot faster. So we're locked into our line there. I've got my block. I'm gonna use my finger as the brake. We want to make sure we don't go out that other side. And then now that we use the 90 degree block here, we know this is relatively flat. So we know because the back of our chisel is flat that that is a good reference area. So we can start there and rotate our chisel down until we find high spots. Found a couple there and we are good. Look at that. That's pretty square. I see one little high spot right here, but I won't bore you guys with trying to take this thing down to perfect. The point of all that is, that's really good chisel technique to do joinery and help you get a nice, smooth, clean mortise or half lap. Another great example of what chisels are good for before we wrap this up is rounding over proud joinery like dovetails or a tusk mortise and tenon, and they're great for chamfering edges. So let me show you how that works so you can see there's kind of a special way to do that so that you don't get blow out or ruin your piece. So when you're doing proud joinery like this, you don't wanna go across because when you get to the corners, you're gonna get blow out. So what you wanna do is you come up at a skewed angle like this and you work backwards towards your corner closest to you. And then you can keep doing that. And once you have this corner rounded over, this one's not gonna blow out when you go over it. So then you're gonna just keep going just like that and you keep working around. And then if you're doing long ones, what you can do is flip it over and this gives you control. And you just wanna go slow using your hand as a break. You can skew it just a little bit. You want to skew away from the grain. And then this allows you to sort of control the depth. And if you go slow enough, you can get a perfect, nice, even chamfer across the whole board. So those are some basic techniques for your average Joe Woodworker. And I think I want to stress to you that don't beat yourself up if you're not getting perfect, clean, clean joinery right off the bat because you know, these guys who are showing it to you have been doing it for years and years and years, and it's tough to get perfection, but it's really easy to get to 98% with a little bit of practice. So do your best and work hard on practicing just some of those basic things and make sure your hands are never in front of the chisel because that always ends your day in the shop early and you got to go to the ER and that's not fun because I do that about once every six months. If you want to support the channel, head over to camtools.com. I've got so many links down in that pinned comment of things we talked about this video, including that sharpening jig, a chisel video, and some other great links. Uh, we also have some really cool products coming out, so sign up for that email email list. I'll link it in the pinned comment. Guys, as always, stay safe in the shop and have a wonderful day.